When we think of nuns what comes to mind is monasteries, chastity, purity and innocence but medieval nuns were consumed with lust. Little More Priory faced various controversies at the beginning of the 16th century that included claims of immorality among the nuns and their abbess. Five centuries after those shocking occurrences, archaeologists excavating a church in Oxford discovered the corpses of nuns who had perished in shame, after being accused of promiscuous behavior. Due to nuns' sexual immorality, 92 bones spanning from 600 to 900 years ago were discovered at Oxford, and were buried upside down as a symbol of their shame. Witches, outcasts, great sinners, and everyone else who had polluted the Middle Ages society with their immoral and promiscuous behavior were interred in this manner. Most of those who were interred were women in their thirties, and one woman was even buried face down with a child wedged in between her legs. The woman's peculiar position might have been a penitential gesture on the part of those who buried her in the expectation that it would atone for her transgressions. This discovery led many people to suspect that they were deviant burials, and somehow connected to the infamous nuns residing in what became known as one of the worst nunneries in history. What transpired in monasteries in the Middle Ages? What sort of perversions were committed by the nuns who resided there? Well, let's find out. This is History Rediscovered, to support please subscribe. In this episode we discuss the shameful behavior of nuns in medieval Europe. The Benedictine Priory of Littlemore was founded by Robert de Sanford. The Littlemore Priory scandals took place between 1517 and 1518. They involved accusations of immorality and sometimes brutal violence among the Benedictine nuns, and their prioress at St. Nicholas Priory in Littlemore. During the final years of King Stephen's rule in the 12th century, Robert de Sanford formed the Littlemore Priory. Later, Henry Ill showed favoritism for the monastery by providing advantages and funding its upkeep. The monastery also obtained a specific plot of land during the following years, and the king was given permission to go to the forest twice a week to collect wood. In the summer of 1517, as the monastery progressively fell into poverty, it lost the king's favor. When they had the chance to observe what was happening in the monastery governed by the, the last prioress and abyss Catherine Wells, Dr. Edmund Hoard Commissioner of Bishop William Atwater and Chancellor Richard Rostun visited the monastery. They were astounded to learn that when Dr. John Darby, the previous commissioner, visited the monastery several decades prior, there were seven nuns present who all refused to sleep inside the building out of fear that it would collapse. As a result, they spent a few weeks outside the monastery and left with passions. The worst prioress in England. Maybe it isn't appropriate to say that the nuns in this monastery were obsessed with or had lust, but that was definitely the case in this setting. When most people think of nuns, they usually conjure up images of strict rules and foregoing pleasures that belong to people outside the monastery. This was not the case with these nuns, who embraced all the pleasures of life without any hesitation, including the abbess. There was a lot of intimate activity there, giving the impression that the location was more like a brothel than a monastery, which is not what one typically associates with monasteries. When all of this is considered, it is not surprising that this monastery eventually met an unsavory end since during the conservative Middle Ages, it was not permitted to have a certain form of brothel and a women's monastery where men could visit and have relations with nuns in private. The priory is listed as one of the worst nunneries that have ever existed and for which documents have been preserved by Eileen Power in her book Medieval English Nunneries. And the main reason for this was a particularly flawed priorist. In many ways, Catherine Wells the Abyss was a contentious individual because she had an illegitimate daughter, and received visits from the child's father Richard Hughes. She also got wasted in the convent and had inappropriate relationships without feeling guilty, and she paid for her extravagant and perverse lifestyle with funds meant for the monastery. Wells stole Little Moore's pans, pots, candlesticks, base scenes, shets, pellets, and fader beds from the common store to provide a dowry for her baby daughter with the intention of having her daughter marry a good man. The nuns had no money for food, clothing, or other expenses. Even though she was immoral and the nuns should not look to her as a role model, she violently chastised them when they broke the rules. Any nun who disagreed with her would be punished by being imprisoned in a room and denied food or drink for a number of days. According to a report from Edmund Horde, commissary of the bishop who visited in 1517 and 1518, it wasn't just Catherine. There were reports that another nun had an illegitimate child by a married man of Oxford, 
and that the prioress complained that one of the nuns played and romped with boys in the cloister and refused to be corrected. The abbess was reportedly urged to give up Hughes by the nuns, but she responded that she would never do so since she loved him and would always adore him. They also lacked much morality because some of the girls there had children outside of marriage. Catherine refused to accept responsibility for the scandals, claiming that the nuns only acted immorally in the convent and that she punished them for their sins. The nuns accused the abbess of immoral behavior, and then there were counter-accusations. She alleged that a nun was engaging in sexual activity with boys while punishing her, but the nuns stormed the room and freed her from jail. She was severely beaten, and after the other nuns saved her, she spent two or three weeks staying with a close friend. Several nuns spent two or three weeks outside in order to fulfill their fantasies of having relations with the men they adored. There were rumors that a nun had an extramarital kid with a married man in addition to the abbess. Wells wasn't truly following the restrictions she put on the nuns who complained about her cruelty and immoral behavior since she was fascinated with discipline but also with immorality where it didn't belong. The superior attempted to set a good example for the nuns by enforcing stringent regulations that she herself did not follow at all. She was spending all the money on a sinful lifestyle while she was wandering around eating rations with Hughes, and the monastery was crumbling. Because the sisters disapproved of her lack of devotion to contemplation and wasteful expenditure of their funds, the abbess' actions damaged the monastery's reputation, which led many young women to decline recruitment. And under what circumstances they might survive, and the bishops found it impossible to comprehend what was taking place. The events at Little Moor in many ways harmed the Church of England's reputation. The monastery was getting worse and worse, money was being wasted on bacchanalia, and the roofs were leaking. A visitation made in 1445 noted that the nuns were scared to sleep in the dormitory, because the monastery's reputation was so gravely at risk. By instructing the nuns to claim that everything was okay, Wells attempted to hide her wrongdoings. A few months later, Bishop Atwater called the abyss to appear in court. She was accused of a variety of promiscuous and immoral behaviors, as well as certain thefts that disrupted the monastery's regular operations. While Catherine was given a punishment of dismissal, she was nonetheless permitted to carry out all tasks until a suitable successor was found. The kinky nun then acknowledged that she had been acting immorally for the previous eight years without ceasing. Nobody knows how the whole thing turned out or what happened to Wells and the nuns following the scandal. Their situation was viewed as mysterious up until 2012, when their remains were discovered buried upside down. It is thought that their sins were later absolved. By medieval standards, the sins committed were so grave that the nunnery was shut down in the middle of the 16th century. In 1524, she was imprisoned by the English King Henry VII's advisor at the time. The priors were paid a pension of six pounds, 13 shillings, and four pence after Thomas Wolsey, the Lord Chancellor, recommended that the priory be dissolved. With only one building remaining unaltered, the monastery was progressively destroyed and turned into a farm. The Deer Lick Priory Tavern, which was vandalized by football supporters in 2013, is the sole remaining portion of the structure that has survived from the Middle Ages to the present. The entire human tradition is permeated with sexuality and various intimate fantasies. Stigmas associated with the expression of sexuality have existed in some societies and continue to do so in others. In conclusion, the circumstances at Little Moor were neither the exception nor the rule. Many convents were honorable organizations where nuns performed their responsibilities with respect and devotion. Little Moor might have lived to see another day but England's heyday of nunneries and monasteries was coming to an end. Worsely, Thomas Cromwell and others used Little Moor as an example to support Henry VIII's creation of a new religious order, and the reformation and eventual dissolution of the monastic houses. In the end, rather than feelings of regret, the closing of Little Moor was probably greeted with a sigh of relief. <laughs>